So in 1996, I wrote a story for the Boston Globe about how New England Wiccans were reacting to a story about the trial of a Connecticut school bus driver who was accused of casting spells to seduce a 14-year-old student. A week or so after that article was published, I received a letter in the mail. Um, it was in this fabulous, creamy, thick envelope. And my address was written in blue calligraphy on the front. And there was a red a wax seal that kept the flap closed. And when I opened the letter, all kinds of herbs and ribbons fell out of it. So my husband, Ted, was standing with me when I opened that letter. So of course I had to read it out loud. Um, and I saw immediately that the inside was written in that same kind of blue, swishy calligraphy that had to have been done by some kind of uh, quill pen. And it said, uh, Dear Mrs. Boynton, your story helped dispel many myths about Wiccans. We are too often misrepresented and misunderstood, but your story helped convey some of the truths about Wicca and witchcraft, which we wish more people understood. Thank you and blessed be. There was no name and there was no signature, but at the end there was a PS that said, I think that you're either a Wiccan or a witch too. Well, I can tell you that I'm not a Wiccan. Um, whether I'm a witch, I guess that kind of depends on who you ask. Um, but my husband, who is afraid of anything that remotely is attached to the supernatural, was like, you have to burn that letter immediately. You have to bury it in the backyard um, because we can't take the risk of any kind of ghosts or spirits coming into our house. But I thought the letter was fabulous and I was not about to throw it away. And so I put all the herbs and ribbons back in, back in, I sealed it back up and I put it away. And every once in a while, I come across that very fantastic letter and it reminds me about why I became a writer, which is to use my voice to tell stories, to continue really necessary dialogues and to help people better understand one another. You know, understanding is where empathy, compassion, justice, and peace come from. And unfortunately, we don't have enough of any of that in our world today. But I believe if there's anything that can change hearts and minds, um, it is through the power of stories. And this plaque that we are going to dedicate here today, today tells the story of a time in American and Connecticut history that is so unknown that in 1818, when Yale-educated historian Benjamin Trumbull wrote a complete, a complete history of Connecticut, he stated in the preface of the book that it contains, quote, no account of witchcraft in Connecticut because after the most careful research, no indictment of any person for that crime, nor any process related to that affair can be found. Well, his history wasn't that complete because we know that wasn't true. Uh, during the 17th century, at least 50 Connecticut residents were charged with witchcraft, 34 were formal, formally accused, and 11 that we know of were hanged like Goody Knapp. Now, most historians believe those numbers um, may actually be higher, but I think that those statistics are startling enough, compounded by the fact that Connecticut holds the very dark honor of being the very first place in young America to execute someone convicted of witchcraft and that was Alice Young in 1647. Goody Knapp, she was the sixth person uh, in the 1600s to be convicted and hanged for witchcraft here in Connecticut. We don't know Goody Knapp's first name, I wish we did, but we do know that her case was one of the most dramatic and contemptuous in Connecticut witchcraft history. Uh, she and another woman, Mary Staples, as you've heard, came under suspicion shortly after Goody Bassett from Stratford 
was hanged on as a witch. And she claimed during her hanging that there was another witch in Fairfield. So what specific deeds Goody Knapp and Mary Staples might have done that led to them being suspected of being that witch is unknown, though I would imagine a big part of it is guilt by association. But Goody Knapp, she really didn't help herself during the investigation. Court documents tell us she did not quietly demur or cry or beg for mercy. Rather, when one of the magistrates questioned her, saying, you should speak before the devil silences you forever, Goody Knapp looked at him and replied, take heed the devil hath not you, for you cannot tell how soon he might be your companion. When asked to condemn Mary Staples as being a witch, Goody Knapp had a similar reply. The truth is you would have me say that Goodwife Staples is a witch, but I have sins enough to answer for already, and I will not add this to my condemnation. I know nothing by Goodwife Staples, and I hope she is an honest woman. After Goody Knapp was found by investigators to have witch marks or abnormal teats on her body that were believed to be for imps or familiars to suckle on, Mary Staples took a turn to defend Goody Knapp, angrily telling authorities that Knapp had no more teats than any other woman and that she was wrongfully charged. Yet Goody Knapp was found guilty. And one of the many injustices at that time was the court system itself. At this time in Connecticut history, the purpose of the trial was not to prove whether the accused was guilty. You were guilty if you were arrested. The purpose of the trial was for you to prove that you were innocent. Now, if you were Goody Knapp or any of those who stood trial, how would you prove what evidence would you use to show without a doubt that you were not a witch? So maps from this time show that there was an empty lot roughly here, right between a house and a mill. And this is where the gallows was erected, which actually was more than likely a, a noose that was hanging from a tree. Now records state that on the day she was hanged here, Roger Ludlow spoke with her and she refused again to indicate anyone else as being a witch. She also warned all of her executioners to take heed, the devils have not you. Goody Knapp, she was outspoken, unyielding, she was unafraid. She seems to have personified absolutely everything that Puritans believed that a good God-fearing woman should not be and everything that a dangerous devil-influenced woman was. And I have a feeling that a lot of us here today are outspoken, unyielding, and afraid. And back in the 1600s, we might have been in trouble too. But Goody Knapp, she lived during a period of history that was as ruthless then as it can be riveting today, but also part of a history that's been forgotten. And I am so thrilled that this plaque help changes that. The stories of Connecticut's witch trials and their effects on the lives of people like Goody Knapp, they need to be heard because they provide reminders of where misunderstanding, ignorance, lack of empathy, and most importantly, where fear can lead us. This plaque, it tells us the story of Goody Knapp. It asks us to consider not just the story of her life and her story of Connecticut's witch trials, but it also asks us to consider the story of who we as people once were and who we as people want to be. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today.